also record. Okay, we are recording. This is uh, Darwin King at Samson Community College for ELC 117 Motors and Controls. This is our day four on Thursday, January 14, and we're going to get rolling here, pick up from where we left off yesterday. And um, so where we left off was looking at single phase motors. We looked at that basic diagram and then we broke it down and got into the, onto the main plate. And we looked at how to wire high voltage and low voltage, 115 versus 230. Does anybody have any questions about, about that? Now, here's what I got on Moodle. You go to the Moodle here, I put, I put the actual lab sheet in there that I gave you. It shows the little hydraulic pump here. It's got that motor on there, that dual voltage motor. It shows your schematic. That's your switch. And the, the dash lines represents the enclosure that has the switch and the thermal overload built into it. And there goes your motor. Got a hot wire and a neutral if, for 120. And then there goes the nameplate. Everybody, I think everybody was good on the nameplate, right? Okay, so now we're gonna go even a little bit deeper in it and look at the windings inside the motor and try to make some sense out of why do we do what we're doing here? What does that even mean? What does it mean and why are we doing it? I mean, it's okay that you just do it and, and it's right and it's gonna work, whether you're 115 or 230, but if you're like me, you kind of want to know why. Do you, do you ever wonder well, why do we do it that way? What's the reason behind that? Well, there's, there's a clear reason behind it. And, the next thing here is I've got a handout uh, that shows the internal windings of, of the motor. And let's see if I can enlarge. Yeah. So I'll give you, I'll give you the internal, an internal uh, winding drawing that's going to really, uh, you know, you'll be glad you've seen this, but just it'll get it clear enough. find out with me that uh, when I see something, if every little thing about it's not obvious, then I'm going to dig a little more. I'm going to get my shovel and I'm going to dig a little more. You know, until I get to where I can see you the whole thing, inside and out. Um, I, I won't really like how things fit. If anybody here likes that, you want to have things fit. Sometimes. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. Yep. Okay, so this shows the internal windings of the motor itself. Now I'm going to compare that and we'll put that and then the other one side by side. But you can see if you go to this other drawing, it's going to show. I got them side by side here. I got, you can also click that on, on, on Moodle and see it side by side. So let's look at it, the, the rhyme and the reason behind, you know, what this is. And maybe let's see, is it gonna let me draw? I guess it won't let me draw with a, well, maybe, well let's see if I can, maybe, maybe it will. Yeah, well, if I stretch it this way and then enlarge, then my pen function is still there. I go up this way. And, uh, yeah, then I can now I can draw. Yeah. Oh. Now, the first difference between the nameplate and the internal drawing, that, that drawing didn't come from GE. I looked on the GE website, and they ain't got nothing that shows the guts of it, but I found something in a butterball book that does. 
and there's one slight difference and it's the wiring number. So if you take a look between wire number 10 and wire number five, okay, over here on the motor, you have, you have wire numbers one, you got one, two, three, four, and they skip five, and then they go eight and they go 10, right? Now over here on this drawing, they go one, two, three, four, and then they go five, and then they go eight. So the difference between, what's the difference between these numbers and those numbers? I mean, just in how many numbers there are. Let's just start there. So all of the numbers are, are there on both of them, except what's the difference? They change the number on one of them. Okay. So over here, there's not a five, right? Uh -huh. There's a 10. Right. You know, over there, there's not a 10, but there's a five, right? So for some reason between GE and whoever, whoever that drawing is from, they don't give a company name. It's just a generic drawing. So over here, what we can do just, just to say that it matches, we're going to come over here and X that out and we're going to say, T10, how about that? And then just make it match. And just, then, it, then it will match. And so over here, wherever five is, we're going to put uh, T10 and T10. Is that okay to do that? When you do the reversal, when you do the reversal to make it to make the motor go the opposite way, you're reversing black uh, J10. It's J10. Black J10 or red, red or T8. So you're reversing black and red when you when you when you reverse the motor. You're reversing 10 and 8 over here. 10 and 8, which happens to be black and red. Is it? Don't let me don't let me get myself tongue tied up here. So we, we'll get it all ironed out here in just a second. That's the only difference is just that particular one number. Companies can change a number and they got a right to do it. I don't know why they did, but so whoever did that, that's the only difference. So if you look at uh, if you just uh, if you go with that and say that when you go to low voltage on this motor, you're going to connect the um, two, four, and 10, right? Which would be black, yellow, black, white, yellow, two, four, 10. Over here, two, four, and 10, they're together, right? That's the same, isn't it? And then we're gonna hook up the blue, orange, the red, which happens to be one, three, and eight. One, three, and eight, and it, this is the same as that, isn't it? It's the same, it's the same configuration. You know, in your incoming line, if you're going 115 volt, this would be hot, and this would be neutral. Right there, hot and neutral. Now, if you go on high voltage, you're gonna hook up the four and 10, which happens to be black and yellow to line one. Now this would be for 230 volt and it would be considered to be line one, which is hot. And then this over here would be line two, which is also hot for two for 230 volt. For 230 volt, both of them are hot. And for 120 volt, you have a hot and a neutral, okay? So if you go high voltage with the same motor, the L1 hot, it goes to black and yellow or four and 10. Over here, four and 10, you see that? Everybody agree with that? And then the, the red, white, orange, which happens to be two, three, and eight, they go together with a wire nut and they don't go anywhere, they're insulated. So it's two, three, and eight together here. Two, three, and eight, they're together here, see that? Insulated. And then uh, T1 or blue, it goes to, to line two. T1 or blue. T1 
one is go, goes to, to line two. So line one, line two, a 230 volt, and this here's 115 volt. All right, so does everybody agree that those match other the other than the numbers the, other than the number 10 you know versus the number five that's does everybody agree it's the same thing okay. you got yes i gave you you got the motor yeah, yeah you got that plus i got it on modal too and we're comparing we're going from, you know, the book shows you just two wires going to the motor. The hot wig is being switched with a manual switch. The neutral goes straight to the motor, and the, the book doesn't show you the end, it doesn't show you the hookups just in the cat head. It doesn't show you that in, in and off of the motor. And it's the main plates over here. And then, you know, I gave you a snapshot of this. Okay, so any questions up to this point? Okay, so the next step is, is so why do we hook it up that way and who come up with that and what can, what's the reason behind those particular hookups? And do I have to hook it up that way? Absolutely. Okay, so the reason behind is this. When you get inside the motor, there are three windings in there. What, what I mean by a winding would be, um, let's just say, most things in motor controls have windings in coils. Coils of copper wire. This contact for a motor starter that tools in to run the motor, back in the back of it has a coil or a set of windings that acts as an electromagnet. For instance, so if I take this apart, I'm going to show you what a, a set of windings look like. Motors have windings in them, and things that have motion and do work the bulk of it's got windings in them. So in, in something, this is easy for me to take apart here and just show you what a set of windings look like. And when you put power on, it turns into a magnet and it pulls the contacts in and it makes the motor run. Well, on a motor, the windings in there, when you put power on them, it makes a rotor turn. It works on electromagnetism. And um, so with this, I'm just going to go in and pop the back of this off like that. And I'm just taking the contactor apart and you have a spring and you have an armature that moves up in here. You got, you got contacts that make and break, that make and break. And the spring, you know, the, the armature in here, it is, it is pulled in and, and released by a coil. The coil is, well, let me get you one of this that I don't have taped up. This is a, uh, the one I had taped up is actually a bad one that I made bad on purpose. One of my toys I give you for, for putting bugs in. <laughs> I, didn't know it, I didn't know it ended up back there. I'm glad I found it. I had lost this thing. This is one of my tricks up my sleeve. Now, here we go. So the, we're taking the motor starter apart, and then what actually draws the contacts in is that coil. So I'm gonna pass that around, and it's a it's a shiny it uh, coil, and it has two two leads on there. These are the coil terminals, and you put power on that, a hot and a neutral on that. This coil turn it's got like a bunch of bunch of wraps of, of of wire. It turns into a magnet, and it pulls, it draws. So it draws. It draws these contacts in, and it and it makes uh, sets the contacts closed, and it took, puts three phase power to a motor, and it makes the motor run. So, the action of one coil pulls in three sets of contacts, and it puts three legs on the motor it instantly. Bam! It's like hitting three switches at one time, and it's done by way of a coil. The coil is run from push buttons, so you're going to be getting into that. But in this chat. You know, the push buttons actually put power on the coil, and then the coil pulls in all three contacts and it shoots power to the motor in the motor. So that's, you know, you know this is called a pilot device that runs a coil, and the coil 
runs the armature and it pulls in several contacts at one time. I'm gonna pass this around. That's what a, a, a like in a motor. That a, that's a small version of what's in a motor. It's a wind. You know, it starts out like like thread. They they start out and they'll solder a wire to this. I gotta keep remember somebody's watching. They'll take a long thing of wire and they'll solder one end of it to this and they got a machine that'll wrap, 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 wrap. And then the other end of it, they solder here. And so that has a pile of windings in there and it's a strong magnet when you put power. It's, a, it's an electromagnet. So I'm gonna pass that around. I'm gonna leave it apart like that you can see the, the parts, okay? So, this zigzag line, that represents a winding, a set of windings. In, in, a, in this particular type of a motor, it's called a split phase squirrel cage design. It's a squirrel cage design of the motor itself construction. And split phase has to do with this. Between, between the one phase, it's actually splitting it between two main windings in the motor. It's just a particular type of a design of, of a single phase motor. That, that in, instead of having one main winding, there are two, and it splits that phase. Um, so, and then you have a start winding, and you have the main windings, which is also called run to run windings. So if I say the run and the main, it's the same thing, okay? Now, so let's take a look. When you connect it up low voltage, what do we have? The way they're hooked up right now, it agrees with this drawing up here. So the main, the main incoming line, hot and neutral. The hot wire goes to, it goes to where? It goes to one and you got one, three and eight, right? One, three, and eight. Everybody agree with that? And then the other line you have coming in, it goes where to four and ten and two. So four, ten, and two. Everybody agree with that? Now, so what you have here is I'm gonna I'm gonna make a note here and go in here and I'm gonna say, you know, there's a hot wire here. I'm just gonna put H. H for hot. And then the other end of this winding right here is actually hit the neutral with it. So neutral is right here. I'm going to put it in. So if you measure across that particular winding, how much voltage would you get if this is 120? 120 coming in. The hot wire is on that winding, and then the neutral wire ends up on, on that end of that winding. So if I check across the winding, how many volts do I get? Real simple, 120. Now, at the same time, if that hot wire is also going to the top of this winding, let's put H right here, and then the neutral also goes to the bottom of this winding, N for neutral, and so if I measure across that winding, what do I get? 120, does everybody agree? So we're getting 120 across this winding, and we're also getting 120 across that winding. The hot is here on the, on the top of this one, and the hot is on the top of this one, and then the neutral is at the bottom of this one, and the neutral is at the bottom of that one. That's what you call parallel. So those windings are wired in parallel. So when, when the top leg is hot, and this top leg is hot, and that bottom one is neutral, and that bottom one is neutral, it's the same thing as them being side by side in parallel. That makes sense. So when you wire when you wire a single phase motor low voltage, you, you're wiring the run the start windings or the run the main windings. They're wired in parallel versus series. That's what goes on inside the motors. They're actually in parallel by the way you configure them with wire nuts. That makes sense. Parallel is like side by side. If you and somebody else are side by side, but if you go single file and you're in front of one another, that's called series versus parallel, parallel side by side. You know what I mean? 
Okay, so this is back to intro to electricity. If you've had ELC 111 with me in the fall, then you know exactly what we're saying here about parallel and series. If you've had it, if you have it, you'll get the class in the fall. You have to have it for, for you know, for this degree or the certificate. So, and also, how much voltage do we measure across the start winding? So if you follow it across, and by the way, where the start winding is out here, you've got a start capacitor. That symbol is a capacitor. A straight line and a curved line, that represents a start capacitor, which is, is this thing right here that sits in that cover. So your, most of these single phase motors are going to have this. They're going to have that. When you take that off, you have a, you know, you have a boot that goes on each end of this. There's two wires that come from the inside the motor. These two leads here, where this capacitor hooks up with these, with these uh, stabs here, would be would be right here. So where my fingers are are the two disconnects for the capacitor. And so the capacitor itself, what it does is it, it charges up, kind of like a battery, but short term. And this capacitor gives the motor a kickstart, kind of like the jumper cables that, that you know you have a car that, that needs a jump. This gives it a jump. If, and if this is no good, if it's bad, if it's disconnected, or if it's bad, what'll happen when you put power on the motor? The motor will just sit there and do this. It'll, it'll go, <laughs> and, it, and it might go a little slow. It might go, or it may just sit there and go, and huh, it won't do anything. So at your house, how many of you have, have kind of been aware of when, you, when you're uh, heating an air system, when the fan goes out and the service guy comes over and you ever been outside with him and he, he is saying, you know, well, your fan's not working, your blower ain't working, he starts to, he proceeds to check this because, you know, there's power there and it hums, but yet the fan doesn't turn. It's a common thing that happens a whole lot. These things, when they go bad, they can swell up, burst, you know, they, a lot of times you can just see that they're bad, but you, you know, I'll show you how to check them today. You'll learn how to test it with a meter. It's very easy to do. So anyway, but the start capacitor, the, the function of it is this. That start capacitor is wired in series with a start winding and it stays in the circuit up until from the, from in the beginning, this centrifugal switch CS, is actually closed in the beginning. It's a spring-loaded switch that's in the back of the motor. So here, embedded behind the fan, the fan here, the cooling fan, in the guts of the motor, there's a spring, and it's got that switch closed in there. And when you start the motor up, the centrifugal switch is, is, is made. So it's closed in the beginning like this normally closed, or you could say NC, but I don't know why they drew it open that way. It should have been drawn normally closed. But I'll say NC or normally closed. So in the beginning, from a dead stop, the switch is closed. The capacitor is connected to neutral through the winding, and then the winding is hooked up to the hot in the beginning. So as soon as power is applied to the motor, you get power across the uh, main windings in parallel and also across the start winding with the capacitor in series giving, giving a kickstart. So the motor begins to turn and when it gets up to about 75% of the top RPM of whatever's listed on the nameplate, which would be, what, what's the RPM of, of the motor? 1725, so somewhere around 75% of that when it gets up to that point, when it gets over the hard, the hard part of getting it up, when it gets up to about that percent, that's when the, the centrifugal force of the motor overcomes the spring and swings it open. And when it swings it open, the switch opens and it takes it out. And it disconnects the start capacitor and it disconnects the starting winding and it runs on the main windings from 75% on up and it just stays that way. Now, if you listen really good, when we cut that thing off, you don't really hear it engaging them again. I mean, it's already made. 
But when you cut it off and you hear it slow down, you'll hear a point to where you will you will distinctly hear a click, and you'll hear that switch reclose because it's a, it's a it's a heavy spring in there that does it, a set of springs, and you hear the mechanism go click. It's a definite thing you can hear. You just got to sit there and wait for it. So problems you can run into on the motors can be most of the time the capacitor will be will be out. That's what happens most of the time in heat and air systems. The centrifugal switch could possibly be bad, but not very often. But if it is, then all you have to do to test it would be to take the capacitor out and put an ohm meter just for checking ohms, checking continuity. It, with it disconnected from power and put an ohm meter on it from here. When it when the leads took loose from this, you can you can check from here to the T8 lead and read continuity through the winding, and you would also be checking is this open or not? Is it open or not? So you would know um, by if you get if you had a continuity reading that the switch is either bad or not. If it said OL on the meter o, over limit, you would know that the switch is no good. And if it was, if you get a low, a low resistance reading, of just the, 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 the resistance of, of the winding, you would know that the switch is fine. You know, and then you have the issues of, of the windings can be shorted to ground. So then you can check, take your own meter and read from each winding to ground to the frame of the motor and see as it's shorted to ground. So those are things that we'll get into to see is the motor bad or not. So you can have windings that are shorted to ground you can have a winding that's actually burned open. The winding is burned open. You can separate all of them like we have right there and read continuity through the windings by reading from one to two along, just those two wires, and get a continuity reading through that winding. And if it says OL, then that winding is shot. It's actually burned open. The same thing on that winding, you can check when you unhook everything and separate them, check from three to four through the winding and, and the ohm meter should give you a fairly low, low reading. And that can tell you is, is the winding burned open. If it's burned open, it's gonna say OL on the meter like for over limit. If you get a fairly low reading, then the winding is, is there, it's not burned up. But if you check from the winding leads to ground, and you get a reading, then it's shorted the ground. You're not supposed to have any reading the ground on any of this stuff to the frame of the motor. So those are those are your different things you can check that can get that can be bad with the motor. Now, a lot of time, like on these farms and stuff, that motor is going to smell. It, it's going to be it's it's smoked and it smells and it and you just know there's no sensing. You don't need to do any of this. You just get rid of it, put another one on there, right? But if you got one that ain't got no symptoms like that, and if you got time to check it, which you probably don't right then, go ahead and swap it out. And then when you take it out, if it doesn't smell, you know, and especially if you swap it out and that wasn't a problem, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> then you can you can verify those things before you put it back on the shelf to, in, in, in the stock room that the motor was okay by, by checking this stuff if, if you choose to which is a good idea. Uh, so anyway, so each winding needs 120 volt to operate properly to give you the proper horsepower, which would be, what's the horsepower? It's a half a horse. So, you know, if you got, if you're within that voltage range and you're gonna get a half a horse out of the motor. Um, is, is everybody good to go on how, how the motor functions internally on low voltage? Okay, so these windings are hooked up. How, are they hooked up in series or parallel? What, what are they? They're parallel, okay? Now at the same time, they're in parallel. And then also the start winding, would you say it's in parallel with those two? It is, it is because look, because the hot wire is also here, it's present here, and then this leg is actually hooked to neutral with it. So all three windings get 120 volts across them. If you if you measure that, if you probe up into wire nuts, you get a 120 across each winding, and the motor satisfied, and it, it'll give you that half horse there when it runs. So now let's change the scenario and say that instead of it being 120, that you're you're on a hog farm or turkey farm and they're running everything 230. So, so we're gonna go with the other diagram. 
side of the heater. We're bringing in two hot wires and when you measure voltage across those, it's gonna say 230 with the meter. It won't say 120, but I'm gonna draw a ground symbol here. That's gonna be ground. If I measure with a meter from L1 to ground, it's going to read, somebody tell me this being in, in other classes out here, like, what would that read? If I read from L1 to ground, what would the voltage be? Hmm? How much? Checking voltage from L1 to ground. If you go L, L1 to L2 with, with your meter leads, with, with your two probes in your meter, it's going to read 230. But if I read L1 to ground with a meter checking voltage, what would it read voltage wise? 115, it would. Okay. It'll read half, it would read half of the 230. Mm -hmm. Now, what if I read from L2 to ground? 115, it would read half of that, half of that 230. That's exactly right. Each one of these are, are, are 115 when you compare them to ground. But when you compare them to each other, they're actually 230 volts apart as far as pressure. There's that much difference in, in voltage between those two. So though, that's what you would expect voltage-wise when you're reading that with a meter, with a voltmeter. Now, with that being said, it, it, do, do y'all agree that that configuration agrees with this configuration, the, the way they're the way they're, they're the way they're grouped. Okay, now let's look at what happens in here when you change to that. That it it actually puts it puts these windings in series instead of in parallel at that point. So um, L1 goes to goes to four and to ten. L1 goes to four. Yeah, L1, L1 goes to four and it goes to 10. So let's change. L1 goes to four and it goes to 10. L1, L1, and then L1 right here. L1, now the, the confusing thing is these lines are drawn or parallel. I'm gonna do them in, let's just change the colors. Let's put it in a totally different color. Let's go uh, blue, okay? Let's do it in blue. And let's get rid of um, these. Let's go completely blue so we don't get confused here. Um, so L1 and L2. And we're gonna go you know, off, off of these, these numbers in here. So we're gonna go with L1. four in the 10. L1 is going to go to four and it's going to go to 10. Two, three, and eight, they just go together with a wire nut. They just get insulated. Two, three, and eight. So two and three come together with a wire nut. And, and eight, which would be up top. So let's put us a connection there that those are together with a wire nut. And we're gonna put um, insulated. 
insulated wire nut right here between these, between three, two, three, and eight. Everybody follow? They're together with a wire nut. And then you have L2 goes to, <coughs> to T1. L2 goes to T1. So what you have here is this, you have L2 is applied. I tell you what, what I can do to clear this up because to get to get rid of the um, to get rid of the of the lines. Let me let me erase the lines in in, in, uh, in Windows Paint, and we're going to draw the lines again so that we're not sitting here trying to look at something that's with other colors in the background. So let's let's let me let me do something. Let's just put this on hold right here. Just, just, I can pull that right back up. Just give me a second here. In Windows, you got something called paint. And I can pull in. Let's see where. Um, go to. Right there. Let's go larger. And we go, yeah, there we go. Now I'm gonna go in there and do an eraser function. Actually, let me go back, because I had, I had a file pulled up that I, I was gonna do it, where I was gonna modify and then save it. Okay, so let's just do it this way. Let's go back. Now this is a drawing. Now watch here. I'm going to do an eraser function on here and get rid of the get rid of the of the connections. So we're going to uh, we're going to actually erase all of the wiring and we're going to do it from scratch on high voltage. And it's going to get rid of any confusion. Everybody okay with that? It's, it's a free program in Windows you can use, and it's pretty neat. It's kind of crazy what you can do with it. I ain't kidding. It's like, you know, man, I ain't never seen nothing you can do this with, you know, um, and then save it. Um, okay. Uh, now, so everything is completely, there's nothing, it, it, that's sitting there just like it would be with the wires in front of you, right? Now I can go in there and draw. I can do a pin function now and draw and pick my color. I'll even go with a red and, um, you know, to do that in red. So for here, we're going to say L1 and L2. And this is 230. To 30 volts. Now, so, and we have here, we're going to say L1 and L2. And this is, this is insulated right here. It doesn't go anywhere, right? So let's, let's do, is everybody okay with what I'm doing here now? Is it making, is it going to clear it up when we do it like this? So we take, we take L1 and we go to T4 and to this became what? 10, didn't it? 10. It became 10. This here, it became 10. Now, and then where are we at? This here became 10. So we're back to square one. Now, four and 10 get connected to L1. So four, and 10. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. And then we're gonna join two, three, and eight together with a, with a wire nut. So we're gonna put 
two and three together. And we're going to do a jumper, a jumper to eight. So let's put, um, let's do our jumper here. Right there. And those are not hooked to any power line, they're just together, okay? And then, everybody agree with that? And then uh, you have T1 gets L2. So L2 goes to T1. So let's, let's do L2. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna jump across here with a hump here. That's not hooked up, that's just a little jump. And we go to here, is that right? Now, let me ask you this. When you put L1 on, on the bottom of T4, on T4, and you connect these two wire things, when you link them together, it actually becomes, it becomes what? Is that parallel or is that series? It's called series. It's series. Say what again? These two windings now, instead of them being connected in parallel, they're in series. You know it because they're hooked, they're hooked up in line, not beside each other. In other words, the back and the front are not hooked together side by side. That's parallel, but they're hooked up in single file. They're hooked up, that's in series. You know what I mean? That's like if we walk in a single line, that's series. If we walk parallel side by side, that's parallel. That's the way, uh, come, yes, sir. Uh -huh. Huh? You got to talk louder. Well, let's, let's, let's look at the whole thing real slow here. These two, just these two alone. Now let's, let's, let's draw, let's put, let's put our number in there. And I think I can, um, it ain't going to let me use a computer pen. I got, I got to draw with the mouse here when I'm in this thing. So look. So, L1 is present down here, right? L1. And then um, this leg is going where? L2? So L2 is, is right, right there, isn't it? Right. L1 is down here. And then L2. Right. The L2 only goes, L2 only goes to, 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 to there. It only goes there to, to T1, only there. So. Let's, we're going to look at, we're going to examine this in just a second. Let's take a look right now. And just look at, at the main windings here. You have L1 and L2 that's across, that's across the outer part of the series hookup of those two windings, right? So when you hook up 120 from this leg to this one, and these are just in a series connection and they're not hooked to the main power line, there's 120, not 120, I'm sorry, but 230. It's 230 this time, it's 230. You got 230 volt applied from here to here across a series string of two of those in series. So who can tell me the rules in series when you hook up two things in series and you put a, a total of 230 across two things, what is the voltage drop across each one? Hmm? Across each one. If I measure from, if I measure across these two legs here, T1 and T2, 115. Because can, can anybody explain when you put two things in series and you put boulders across the out, the outer legs of them, put that in your own words. What, 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 what does it do to that total voltage? It cuts it in half, it does. It, each 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 winding actually drops half of that voltage. It, it each winding gets half of the weight. 
it's like two guys picking up a 200 pound weight, two guys get under it, each guy feels 100 pounds, you know? That's the way it goes um, in, in series when you do it that way. Whatever the total voltage is, each winding bears half of that. So that's the reason why, why, why that configuration is like it is. It, it looks like it doesn't make no sense out there. But when you get inside, inside the motor and you see that these two are together and they're insulated and they're not hooked to power nowhere, it's just an interconnection that makes them in series. You know, you're going from L1 through this winding and you go through this winding back to L2. So it's 230 across them. But yet if I measure across this one, what do I get? About across this one. Exactly. That's exactly. So, the, so get this. The windings get the same voltage. They still get 115 a piece, even on, even when, when the motor's running on 230, the windings get the same voltage and they don't even know what you did. The windings don't even have a clue that you're running on 230 now because they still get 115 a piece. The windings are satisfied, they're happy, and, they, and, and you're still gonna get, you're still gonna get that half horse out of that motor because the windings are getting the same exact voltage. It's just that you've, you've not played a trick on the windings, but you've just changed the configuration for a dual voltage motor. That's why they have, how they can do it on a dual voltage motor is they've got, they've got the, two, the two main windings that they can do this with. They can do series and parallel, and it gives them the ability to make it to be a dual voltage motor. That makes sense. If you had, if you didn't have a dual, you know, if you had a single run winding, you couldn't, you couldn't run it on two different voltages. You know, that's, but, but in a nutshell, each winding is rated at 115. Each one of them is rated at 115. It actually is letting me draw, that's great. So does everybody see that in both cases, you get 115 volts across each main winding? And so the motor doesn't even know what you did. It honestly doesn't know. And when, and when you go over, now what about, what's the voltage across, what's the voltage across, across the start winding at this point? What's the voltage, if I measure with a voltmeter, I put a voltmeter across here and I read voltage across this one, what would the voltmeter tell me? Look, where you have the split, the split phase, the, the split phase feature here, they're splitting the phase in half with these two windings here. They're taking a, what they call a center tap. It's a center tap on two windings. They're taking a center tap here and they're shooting the center tap. Half of that voltage are shooting it over here to, to the top here. And so you've got half of the voltage up here. And so you got L1, you know, you have L1 here. Well, it's not letting me erase. I guess I have to go back and erase with the mouse. I think this is, this is kind of crazy. Got the eraser function up here. That should get it. It does. Isn't that something? This is a wild program, and I'm telling you, it is absolutely wild what you can do with it. It really is. It's amazing. I taught people with Murphy Family Ventures, a guys that on hog farms all over the place, totally remote, how to wire up stuff in hog farms using paint. I ain't kidding. I've had them guys. <laughs> I'd give them a picture of a float of a float switch and a, and a contactor and, and and all kind of stuff and water valves with no hookups and I would show them how to draw it in paint. No, every one of them at home would draw it and shoot and send me a night. I was great stuff they were doing in paint like this. I did residential wiring that way with them guys with Murphy. I taught 16 guys like that eight weeks and I'm getting ready to start another group up week after next at night on Monday night. And they're, go they're gonna be in Missouri. They're in Missouri if the class makes. They got a few guys interested now, but using paint, I taught guys how to wire stuff up remotely and ain't even never met them. <laughs> anyway. So what was I gonna say? Um, yeah, when, when you trace, um, you have you have L1 right here, right? You got L1. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Earl, the pen in your hand is acting like a mouse. So you have to go on the MS Paint and actually change it from your. I've got to change it in here. Well, you can do it with the pen. I, ain't that crazy? You can do it with the pen. Because your pen is acting as your mouse. Right. You pick it up. So all you got to do is click the. Uh, is it going to let me do it? I, it's going to let me do it up here with the pen, is what you're saying. Yeah, it should. Hey, you're gonna teach an old dog a new trick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we got that's a sharp dude right there. I'm, you, man. <laughs> I'm glad you're in here, man. I'm glad you're in here. <laughs> that's good. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Um I'm old school and new school, so I'm still learning new school, but I'm, I go way back, 36 years in this field. I was a student out here taking electronics engineering from 1984 to 86. I got an electronics engineering degree from here back when they did that, way back, way back in the day. You know. And I worked in plants about 22 years, worked for a control company when the plant shut down, and then I had a chance to come out here and teach, so that's a lot. But I'm still learning, I, and I, yes, I never get tired of learning the stuff, honestly. And you guys teach me all these all these things right here like this. Just do it. Tell me, you know, you see me, uh, you know, don't let me get up here and make a, a dummy out of myself, you know. Just <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, so you got L1 down here, and then how would you label this, this leg here? It's not, it's not L2, is it? But it's actually, why don't we call this CT for center tap? It's a center tap between those two that comes out to here. And, and, and it equals what's the voltage of the center tap. When you measure voltage from, from L1, from when you, when you read from L1 to the center tap, what is it? 115. So that center tap is actually 115 volt here. So the start winding gets to 115 also on, on startup when, um, so they all get 115. You see that you get the idea. Their, their little trick of, of hooking that leg to the center tap, make sure that when you're running on 115, everything gets 115. I mean, I mean let me back up. It makes sure that it, and in both cases that everything still gets 115. All the winding still get 115. You see what I'm saying? The motor doesn't know, the mo the windings don't even know that there's 230 out there. They don't even know it because of the the clever, it's a clever way they come up with it with that split phase, you know? Does that make sense? Okay, so I I any questions? Now, it took a while to do that, but I hope it was worth it to understand really what's going on with the motor. Um, a lot of folks don't, don't have never looked at it this deep, but I'll, you know, There'll be certain things that I'll, I'll take that extra time to do so you'll know really what it is, how it ticks. Uh, there's a reason for all this stuff. So, um, any questions so far? Okay, so now let's take a look at, at how do you how do you test the capacitor? How do you how do you check it? That's a common thing that people ask. Um, and let's see, let's get. When you look in Moodle, I put you an, an electronics uh, a book in there that you can you can download. So take a look at here. It says electronics component book, and it's something that, that, that I teach with other ball. It's got resistors and capacitors and stuff in it that's not included in your book. So you click right here in Moodle. This is you know your week. Week one stuff, there's a lot in there now. The bottom thing I just put in there, right here, well, actually, scroll up, that one right there. This is actually a Butterball electronics book that I'm, I'm letting you get a hold of, okay? When you, when you scroll, let's, let's go back out. If you, if 
you looked here in, in where I put put the link at, I'm telling you to go to page 54. 54 to 59 in that book is going to show you about, about capacitor, resistors and capacitors. That capacitor has a bleed down resistor on it so that when the power goes off, that resistor will actually bleed the capacitor down quickly. But it doesn't stay charged up. If it doesn't have the little resistor in there, what will happen is when you cut power off on the motor, this thing acts like a, it acts like a battery. So when, when the motor's running, it's got a charge on it. And it gives, it, it gives the motor a kickstart at the end. And then uh, the centrical switch opens up. But when the motor cuts off, when you cut it off, there's still going to be voltage on that for a while, for several minutes. And unless you put the bleed off resistor in there, it's soldered in there. I'm going to pass it around and let you see it. It's got a resistor with some stripes on there, soldered in there. And we're going to unsolder it. And we're going to test the capacitor and then solder it back. Okay, you, you, you have to get take one leg of it off to get an accurate reading on the capacitor if you're going to do that. So, um, but the resistor, what it does is it, when the power goes off on the motor, is it actually, it, it takes the charge out of here, it cycles it through the resistor and it dissipates it as heat. So the resistor gets rid of the charge in, in the capacitor very quickly as heat dissipation and, and it's gone and then it's safe for you to handle it and replace it, okay? So you got a capacitor that stores charge, a resistor that bleeds it down. So we're gonna take a look at these two things real quick. Um, I'm gonna pass this around. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at this resistor here. Now this It's insulated. It's insulated. It's what you call insulated. So what he's trying to find out why is the T10 coming off is 115, and then that is insulated. I'm trying to explain to him because you only got 115 coming in. Well, you got 230 coming in here. Well, I'm talking about on the, just on the, the outside. The start line. You start winding. On the start winding. Right. Well, you yeah. only got the 115 coming in there. The center tap is just insulated. It, it is. This this is insulated. In other words, these two wires and this one are put together with a wire nut. With a, there's three wires and a wire nut, but neither one of them hook up to either one of the power legs. Right. So what does that center tap actually do if it's not powered? It's it's just a connection point. It it it, it it's a connection point that that makes the relationship between these two windings be series. It, 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 it's, you take those two wires and you twist them together with a wire nut and they become so basically just a path, right? It's a path. It's a now, I'm, I'm going to give you an analogy. Let's say, for instance, that we're not going to do this, but I'm just going to say we are. If you would hold, hold your hand back like for me, like that. Now, if, if, I, if I join hands like that, we're in parallel. Now, turn this way and, and just put one hand toward me. We do that one in series, and then the, the center connection is insulated. So that would be the center. Tap. That's the center tap would be where I, where I grab his hand, and then this hand is free, and the other hand is free, and we're in series then. And then we're going to hook up L2 over here, and L1 to the other leg, and we got 230 across the two. Does that make sense? Like we're the wire. Now, if we're in parallel, then we're going to do this, and we're going to hook the, uh, the, the L1 and the neutral, and we're in parallel. Make sense? Does that help? Yeah, I'm gonna draw it without that stuff. So they be able to He's trying to draw it on top of what you already got. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can do that. Yeah, yeah. And they got they got highlighters. You can get highlighters of different colors. Like they got orange and they got you know blue highlighters that are that, that are what do you call it translucent. You can see through the colors, and you can do different color how Yeah. Huh? So right there. Um, where your voltmeter is and you're uh, making the start wing. Right. You only getting power from that one, right? 
Yeah, you're getting power from L1, and then you get, and then you, and then you get that that one fifteen from the insulated center tap. So you're also getting one fifteen from the center tap? No, you're not. Because I thought it was just like the connector. It's just like a panel. It, it, it is, but it but it's a it's a real hookup. It's a real hookup. It, there, there in the motor chat head, those three leads would be actually together with a wire nut. Well, no, you're getting it when it's reduced, after it's been reduced by half. Okay. You know, when you have, look, you have L1 here, L1's here, you're getting a reduced version of L2 over here, a reduced version of that. Because it comes from the center tap, the where look, <coughs> L1 and L2 are across the series string. Like when me and him were like, like this, the L1 and the L2 was across our outside hands like that. And when you tap it in the center, you only got half. You only got the voltage that I'm bearing or say the voltage that he's bearing. You know what I mean? You got, you got half that total. When you, tap it, when you tap it in the center tap, you're getting just that part of, of, of the total, half of it. That's pretty clever, the way, the way they come up with it. I mean, it's... That it's called split phase and, and, and it's dual voltage and they, and they whoever come up with it sharp I mean it's amazing this field is this field never is never boring never and and there's so much of just motors in sales there's all kind of motors I've never even seen that I see names of and I say well, man I've never even heard of that you know it's just there's no end to this stuff there's just no end to it we learn what we can in this class, but I'm telling you, this is just the beginning. I mean, it really is. There's, there's a lot of stuff, and you just never will quit learning. It's never boring. It's always interesting. And and to, to get into controls is something that you that there's always going to be jobs, and it's going to be more so that way. And guys that are interested in <laughs> technically getting into this stuff and understanding what's going on, that knows how it ticks and can read the, the name plates and the schematics and all. Are in high demand. Always going to be in high demand. Always, always. You want to you want to know this, and you also want to be willing to turn a wrench and get greasy. Don't be too, don't be too good to, to do that. Be willing to turn a wrench. Be willing to use a hammer. You know what I mean? If you do that, you're gonna have you're gonna have work. That there's gonna be somebody's always gonna be wanting you somewhere. You know, if you if you're open to doing it all, in my opinion. Now, every now and then you get a job to where it's just electrical, but in Sampson County, a lot of the jobs are, you know, they want you to be strong at this, but be willing to also take, you know, do mechanical work too. And that's when I, when I accepted that way back in the 80s, that's when I had work, man. I didn't have work until I opened my, until I broadened out to that. Then that's when it turned on me in Sampson County. So, and you'll be a better troubleshooter in general when you look at the, at the, at the whole system. For you to really say for sure that the problem with the machine is the motor, that it's not a valve, you need to understand valves, you know? You need to understand the whole thing. You, you really need to be very good multi-craft where this program sets you up with hydraulic, pneumatic me mechanisms, you know, elect a lot of electrical. <coughs> you need it all. That's why the degree I had in the 80s, they don't have it here no more. It's, it was exclusively electronics engineering, which is very good. And it's very in-depth electronics that I took. Um, you know, so I was, you know, my thing was, I was going to be one that would get down there and, and find out what's wrong on that computer board and, and actually replace that part. And that's what I, that's my degree is in this, is component level electronics. So where I would sit down at a bench and figure out which chip or which resistor and go in there and unsolder that rascal and put another one in and bam, you fix the board. That's what I did way back in the beginning. But it quickly got things to where they got to where you just replace the board and get out of the way and let the machine run. That's what they're telling the plant now. Hurry up. Just replace the board. We got to run, you know. There's not time to fix this. Just get another one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. So, um, or you could just uh, replace the whole board. You keep the old and replace the board. Now, I did that. I did the first plant I worked in, I did that. They, oh, yeah. they were. That way, if it ever messed up again, you got another one right there. I, I did that, and in the second plant, every now and then, I, I would do a little component level every now and then. But most of the time, it was, they just, there was something always going on, and they, you had to get a machine going for, and you, you were in the replacing modules and sensors and limit switches and valves. 
get on the Google and down there the song of the bill that kept going down. The what? The song of the uh it was was it like automatic or automatic thing or yeah but, like, um, for some reason it just kept like messing up it wasn't going all the way down whatever mm. like, oh, right was it run by maybe a, maybe was it run by air cylinder they have a cylinder that made it go up and down uh, or yeah, hydraulic yeah so there you got a pump involved, a directional valve, flow controls, you got hydraulic stuff. And that's in the afternoons of teaching hydraulics to so that part. That's why you need that too. Because you, your controllers are, are telling a, a hydraulic valve to go and then it makes the, the cylinder move and it makes the saw come down. And you, it's, good, it's good to be able to, to troubleshoot that part of it. And then you can know, is it an electrical problem? going to the valve or is it a hydraulic problem? Is it a bad valve or something? Or, you know, or a misjusted flow control? So anyway, um, so with that being said, um, is, it, is everybody okay with understand what's going on? I know it, it, we took a lot of time to do this, I know. Did, how, how's everybody, would they, everybody understand what, what they're looking at here? Right. When you physically do it, like I've got two motors there. When you physically do it, you know, then you're gonna, you're gonna, you, that's what's gonna settle it for you when you do it, when you actually physically hook them up that way. Um, so, um, we were gonna look at, as far as how, how, how to test the capacitor, we've got about five minutes. Um, and so, what we can do here is, what did I do with the capacitor? The, the capacitor, it's got, it's got two leads on there, and that resistor is soldered across there as a bleed band. It, it does a fast bleed band so it doesn't stay charged, <coughs> uh, so you don't get, you know, a, a shock hazard. Uh, but you can't get fed on them if, if they don't have the resistor on them. you, you got to manually discharge them. Something put a screwdriver across them, they'll, they'll spark, or you can use an a external uh, bleed-off resistor and, and, and bleed them down to check. So um, with this, um, well, I was going to say, I'm going to show you how to solder it. Yeah, we got about five minutes to go. I can't go here and show you how to unsolder it and test it. So let's go ahead and do that. You want, you want to come around, make sure you've got a mask on, and I'll show you how to unsolder one, one lead on and how, how to test the capacitor. And it's starting Monday. I'll have you wiring these up, and you'll start doing some wiring the first thing Monday. I could have used this solder to do my speaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you will, does everybody want to see what's going on here? You want to take a minute, or are you? Are you? I'm just showing you how to do it. Okay. I was going to show you physically how, how to do this if you want to see, but there's a, there's a glob of solder on each one of them, and so I got a little vice here. That vice was actually out here when I was out here back thirty something years ago. I ain't get back. I sound with some of this stuff was gonna get it was gonna get uh, thrown away. Um, got a suction cup on like that to hold it. So when you're soldering, look, you want to wet the sponge, you want to wet it and squeeze it out, and you want it moist, but not like for super, super damp. And you go in there and you're gonna wipe off the oxidation and stuff off of that tip when it gets hot enough. You can spool off enough of that solder. Now you don't use acid core like you do in plumbing, like in brazen. In plumbing, it's not acid core, it could be rosin core. So for, for electronics and wires, it's gonna be rosin core, not acid core. And you put the solder on there like that. You wanna coat that tip really good, nice and clean, and clean it off again. And make sure that tip is absolutely shiny, that there's no contaminants on there like that. Coat it again. And then you can take something called uh, desoldering wick. This is copper braid that actually will absorb solder, kind of like it'll draw it up like a wick in, in a lamp. You know, it'll draw it up in there. 
what you do is you, you lay this on there and then you pull it and it'll soak up the solder into this thing and get it off of there instead of it just being in a big blob. So you, you take it, give yourself some extra to pull with, you lay this on there like that, lay it up against it, move it around, and I pull, and you see it pulling the solder like that right there, it's pulling it off like that, and then you've got the leaders out, I've almost got it off now, so. You want to heat it up again, the lead is exposed, and you heat it up again one more time, and then you've got it off like that. And it was a nice clean removal like that. So um, so with this, it's called uh, desoldering wick. You see how it draws up in the copper like that? And that's, and that's that's how that's done. If any of you particularly wanted to do some hands-on with this, I can, I can set it up and do to let y'all do a lab that way if you're interested. It's not included in the class, but if you want it, I can put it in. Yeah, I guess I need to practice on her. Mm -hmm. You know, I can have you do, you know, to do some things like that, or I can have you do some big desoldering and then removing the compartment and clean the holes and then put it back in, or more practical, do something on some problems like that. It would be more close to what you do. But if you remind me, I'll, I'll make sure that we work some of that in there. So this resistor, again, you gotta take one, one leg of it off and then you can check the capacitor. The capacitors, the, the uh, I put, I put a, a wink, I put a book, I put a book in Moodle, let me just show you real quick, I know it's time to get out of here. I, well, I'm not even gonna open out of it, because Jake's gonna be here just a second. Capacitors are measured in farads to where, Resistors are measured in ohms, but the unit is called farads. And it tells you on the capacitor, it says, and, and they have a range. This capacitor reads between 400 and 480 microfarads, UF, microfarads. So we're going to test it now, see if it's between 400 and 480 microfarads. So you put the meter, you put the meter, there's there's white functions and blue functions on the meter. You go over to the function that shows the capacitor in the blue. You go over to that and it says ohms or capacitance. When when you want to get the blue function, you get the blue button and it changes it over to micro to farads. So each position has a white function and you can toggle between those between ohms and farads. Okay, so when you do that, take the leads and put it across here without touching the other end of the resistor. And let's, let's see, is it between 400 and 480? Nice and solid. Go straight, yeah, you can. Straight down. 443 UF on microfarads. Make sure you come up and see that. You can get up close. You see the little U with the tail? That's a micro symbol. It's a Greek symbol, it's called mu, and it means micro, but it's microfarad. you see that? So it says, if, how many did it say it was? 443. 443, now, so I want you to tell me, 443 microfarads, and the tolerance is between 400 and 480. It's right in the middle. So it's right in the middle, so it's fine, it's past it's fine. Now the bleed down resistor, we'll look at that Monday, the bleed down resistor, you go in blue and you click on that electronic book I put in there for you. And you go to like page 55, I got a note in there in, in the link. And you start looking at color codes, those, those colored bands on there. And those, those bands mean something, and that, that's a that's a, a, a 100K or 100,000 on um, resistor. It's just a brown, black, yellow. And that and it equates to 100,000 ohms. And then the fourth band is gold, and that means it's got like a 5% tolerance. It'll be, it'll be within 5% of that 100,000 ohms. So we'll take a look at that Monday. You can look at it over the weekend, click on there, and read on resistors in that, in that electronic book. And, um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Monday, is, Monday is Mark Luther King Day. It is. So we're not having Zoom. No. The college is closed Monday, but, but take, take a look right here. I'll show you the. You could be reading this, look at here. Um, go, 
Look right here. Down here it says electronic component book. This is in Moodle here now. That's in your Moodle thing. And it says go to page 50, go to page 54. You go in there and you go, you click here and hit 54. And it goes to resistor color codes. So you can you can read in there, and here's where it tells you how to calculate that. So if you got a brown, black, a brown, black, a brown, brown, black, yellow, you know, brown is one, black is zero. That's your first two numbers. Your third, your third color is a multiplier. The, the multiplier tells you how many zeros you have. And it, we happen to have a third color of a yellow in here. And the yellow means four, so you put four zeros on there. So it's a one, brown is one, black is zero. And then you put, because this, the third one is yellow on that resistor, yellow means four, four zeros. One O and four more zeros, that's 100,000, right? So it's 100,000 on resistor. And then the fourth band is gold, and gold for tolerance, the fourth band is called tolerance. Gold means 5%, which means it'll be within 5% of 100,000 ohms when you measure it with a meter. So you can flip the meter over to ohms, put it, you can get, get, get off the capacitor function, get the blue button, and go back to ohms, and you can check, check the resistor, and you can measure, measure the resistor now. The resistor is the resistor. Little, you got to check the blue thing. Yeah. 100.9 K ohms, kilo ohms. See K? So it's reading in K ohms now. You see that? So that, that resistor here. So that's how you can check uh, a resistor. Uh, this meter is it goes super high on ohms to reach capacitance and stuff. Um, and if, if you ever want to invest in a really good meter, that's a good one. So with 1587, it'll do a lot of stuff. It'll actually check in, in insulation, it'll tell you if the motor shorted out. A lot, of meters, a lot of meters may not detect it all the time. This is detected here. If the motor's shorted even a little bit, it'll take up a little bit of short circuit where you know an average meter would. So, anyway, I know we got stopped. So, um, but, but read, you can be reading, and look, you can download that book, it's free. You know, if it's a butterball book, you know, you can download it, keep it on, on your device. It's got a lot of stuff in there. It's got, it's got stuff about uh, resistors, capacitors, you can be reading on capacitors. So there's a chapter on capacitors. You're going to get some electronics in here with this that you can be reading if, if you're interested in it, if you're interested in it. Y'all have a good weekend. Yes, sir. Thanks for coming. Okay. I'll let you know. Yeah. Somebody else said it's after. Yeah. 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 Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'm going to try to do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So purple is L2, yellow is L1, and green will be um, insulated. insulated, and the black will be two. So, mm -hmm. looking in the motor, these two, the um, windings, they won't change positions, correct? So they'll stay like that from one, uh, T1 to T2 and then from T3 to T4. He's right. talking about the main line. Main line, so yeah, main line. Say it again, I, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. So, in the motor, these never move. Physically, they never they move. They never move. They never move. move. You're just changing how you look. How you look. Yeah. So basically, if you read from like, you're getting with these, you have no power running through, right? It's just a path. Well, it, it's a path for power to run through, but but they're not hooked directly to either one of the power leads coming right. in. It's hooked right. at the base of L1. Yeah, not the base. So if you've got power coming this way, and you also have power coming in from here and from there, so that, how does that work? Say it again. So he's saying L2 comes into T1, right? But this is connected to the main, main winding to T2. It has power running through it back to T8. Yeah, so it, it, it does, but you're only getting half of it because the, the, the two windings here are actually bearing half of that 230. Right. You've got 230 across here. Right. So when you measure across here, it's 1, 1 15, and measure across here, it's 1 15. Maybe because I ain't never. Uh, Seeing the diagram without a neutral 
that could be right. There's no neutral here. Right. Not on not on two thirty. There's no neutral. So, uh, like for, so for, for, for two thirty, there's no neutral on that mode. Okay. Now, yeah. now, now there's two thirty. If you go to a closed drive, right. a closed drive, it's got four four prongs on that foot. Mm -hmm. You got L one, L two. They're hot. Two thirty. Then you got neutral, and you got brown on the drive. So is the neutral just a fake to be actually going to meet it or something like that. It, it's not requiring on that, but listen, on a closed dryer, neutral is used because the motor that turns the tub, the motor runs on 120 or 115. But the, but heater, the heater elements run on the 230. Right. So you have to put that, that plug has to have a neutral in it because of the motor that runs that runs the, the tub, the turn the on go. So in other words, whenever you're using like 115, you're going to need neutral, but whenever you're using Started, you, don't. you don't, and, and, and unless, unless that thing, like a clothes dryer, has yeah, got yeah. elements that use 230 and the motor uses 115, then you don't uh, have the neutral. Okay. You, you, you have to have it for a low voltage single phase device okay. if it's low voltage. You know. So it doesn't matter that the two are uh, the two, what do you call them, the L1, L2? It doesn't matter that they're connected. Well, they're not connected, they're, they're, they're connected right. across the load. Right. Across they're not the connected load. together. So but they're connected across a load. You know, they have, there's a load that they're across. If you go back, so when they're they connect across okay. the load, yeah, when you go across the load, where, where will you go? I think they get, so in other words, they've been produced enough to where it equals what it needs to be. Exactly. Yeah, when okay. you, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, when you go, let's see, where, where's our uh, and also uh, the windings in there, the sizes, are they just done that way for convenience? Or does that, that doesn't actually represent size, does it? What, what do you mean? Uh, you know, it's one speed or the other. It doesn't actually As far as the length of them? Yeah, it doesn't actually represent size, does it? Not necessarily, but it may. But it might. It, you know, it may be they're, they're, they're there probably is more windings on that start winding. I mean, I would bet there probably is. I mean, okay. I bet there is. I mean, I don't know that, but, but it's a pretty good chance of it that, that you may have more wraps. You could have. See, you I could just, have. See, I just ain't never seen anything that doesn't have a flow to it, you know. So I understand that, like, everything seems to meet right here, you know. That's what. It's only, it's only, it's only a connection point for, for current to flow through. Okay. It's a connection point. It, it, it causes them two main winders to be in series versus parallel. Okay. No, yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. basically when you want it, want it to go clockwise and say counterclockwise, you're just kind of changing the polarity because it's a magnet. Well, when you when when you change when you when you change the direction, it's telling you to change five and eight, right? Right. Or in this case it's ten and eight. Which would be the outside leg. You know, you've got the, the 10 and the 8. What would the power would be coming in? In that situation, the power would be coming in here, and then you would have your, um, it would just be your pass on the computer, right? If you just, if all you have to do is switch the count clockwise, you switch this. You switch it outside when you start winding. Start winding when, when you flip the polarity of this, yeah. but you don't flip, but you don't flip those. It makes it makes the, the capacitor kick it off in the other okay. direction. Okay, that's yeah. one. That I, 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 we have to bring that back up money, money, morning. That when you flip, when you flip these two, uh -huh. you're changing polarity between okay. between the start winding and the, and the main winding, and it makes it kick off the other way. It okay. makes this kick the other way. Okay, that's what I got you. So in other words, this right here is just the start. It, it, it just starts. It, it just starts it. And then look, that centrifugal pops open when you get up to about 75% of your top speed. That, that. Okay. It does, it does, yeah. Yeah, we've been digging into the high and low voltage and getting into the guts of the, the windings and all. And the, this is in series of where when you do it, low voltage, there, that puts them in parallel. Right. So that's, yeah. that's. The, the single phase motor is older to, to me, is older to work with. Yeah. Yeah. In the three phase. Yeah, there, you got to think more about it. You do. You do. Yeah. Mm, you do. And I, we went. We just went through.
the complete off the back? Yes. I've a lot of people just <laughs> cut them off and go on back to business. What the, the, and I know that's not the right way, but I'm just saying yeah, the bleed off is there so that it'll bleed well, quick. Well, it'll, well, it'll, it'll bleed quick. quick. That's exactly right. It'll bleed quick. It's mm -hmm. not going to sit there and you take it. You know, it's not going to lie something. Yeah. You know, it, it's just for fast bleed now. Mm -hmm. Just for fast bleed now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I show them how to use the wick. They saw her wick. You just mm -hmm. put it on there and then pull it. You know, it'll draw all that salt off that funnel real, real easy and clean yep. on that. And also, anyways, it, it would be better really to put that on, on some stamps and have them in there where it could be took off. Yeah, I wish they would do that's what that's that's how they should be. That's that's I think that's why they've got to a double terminal on that. Yeah, that's how they should be. So you can do it that way. But uh, if this ain't in nobody's way, I'm just gonna let it just sit. Is that okay? Yes, in nobody's way. But a lot of the uh, heat and air units and stuff you go to, yeah. you know, if the compressor has a stall capacity, mm -hmm. um, but you know, most techs, they just cut it off. I know it's not the right thing to do, they just cut it off to check it. And, and then they, 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 they never put it back. They, 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 they back. don't even have a saw in Yeah. But you can get, look, you can get them butane. You can get them that are doing one on butane gas, or you can get battery mm -hmm. saw the knife. Yeah. And guys, they will get them. And put them back on because it's it's fast bleed down for a reason. Um, it ain't a big deal, but it's but it's it's good to have it in there, you know. It's it, it's just something else that you got to do, but you know if you got your little soldering iron, then it's it's not a big deal, you know. That's one thing I want to learn how to do. Well. Well, we're, we're going to, we'll, we'll do that. We'll have it, we're going to have it setting out, so we'll we'll let you do that. Whoever wants to do it, we'll let you do it. Hey, it, it's, a, it's, another, it's another good skill to have because like, plenty of guys don't have a practice on it. Whether you use it once a year or once, or once every two years, and if you've done it and you know what to do, then you might be one out of the group, you might be the only one out of the group that even knows how to do it, you know? But yeah, we can we can we can put that in there for sure. Like I say, I can even go as far as letting you desolder something and solder it back. Or we can just stick the terminal. We can just do something that's normal, normal if you want to. You know, that's, that's something you would actually see in the field. You know, for for what we do. You know, what class is that? Motor control. Y'all do that. Let me know. I'll kind of hold them for that. Okay. Well, it would be, you know, Monday when we'll pick back up whoever wants to do it, we can turn it well, back on. Tuesday. Tuesday, that's right. Yes, but we, we, we won't have nobody be here Monday. Yeah. About it. Four hours. Right? Four hours? I called up there and asked. I thought that's what it was. Yeah. You say cut in half? Mm -hmm. I've heard they cut in half and made the test order. That's what everybody said. Yeah. Are you serious? That's what really? they say. I don't know. But it, it was 8,000 when I took <clears throat> but they cut it to four. Yeah, yeah. But they were six hours when I went. Is that what it was for you? Eight. You got eight hours. Mm -hmm. I had that tape on the store. Yeah. They give me they give me six hours, but with no lunch. Did you get to take lunch? Lunch break? Oh, you talking about the state test? State test. No, yeah, it was six hours. Six but he's hours. talking about the years. So how, how many hours do you need to build you up on that? Yeah, he's talking about four, four hours. Four, four, five, four five, years. Five. Yeah. Four thousand hours. And then she said you can use two thousand hours of the secondary. Yeah. Oh, that's good, real good. But I don't know. I gotta figure out how to calculate it. I mean, the search word to calculate it. I gotta figure out how to do that. Do they go by contact hours? I'm not. I'm not really sure. I gotta, I gotta, there's a pass. There's a passage in it that tells you how to calculate your primary and your secondary hours. I bet. I bet they'll use our, our contact hours. Your face to face hours. To do it, I bet they will. Probably. I bet they will. Because that's actually your involvement with the instructors uh, that, that will say we can sign for. If somebody, if, if I, they need, I need 700 more hours, like outside of like what I've done with Schindler, to have enough to be able to qualify. Right. That won't take you long. I, while, while you're taking these NEC classes, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be building that up. It won't, yeah. it, it won't be long. If you want to go take that class with Jerry, once you get done with these NECs here, by the time you do all that, 
you'll have it either way. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. Jerry, Jerry Burch up, up in Raleigh, I took a class with him. He used to work on the state board. He actually used to help write the exams. He's an inspector in Wake County, and he's, uh, he's getting ready to retire. But he teaches the last weekend each month. He teaches up in Raleigh. He rents a, a conference room in a quality in hotel on Crapple Boulevard. Yeah. He teaches a Saturday Sunday class. I went uh, Jeff Rodriguez, but he passed away now. That's, that's what I went to. That's what Jerry told me that Jerry's getting ready to retire from uh, Wake County Inspector uh, Board. And he said that since Jeff has passed, that his that Jerry's class are probably going to pick up. Yeah. And he's going to look at it going into different counties to teach. And yeah. just staying up there, he's looking at going out and spreading out. He's really good instructor. He's uh, he's uh, he's got a workbook he wrote, and if you go take his weekend class and you do his workbook, take you about eight or ten weeks to do his workbook. Yeah. And he's got an exam. You call him up, say I want you, I'm ready for an exam. He'll email you that. You do his exam, and he tells you if it's um. What they, what they call favorable. He'll tell you if it's favorable for you to go ahead and go to Raleigh. Okay. He'll, he'll recommend you to go or, or study more. You see, Jeff helped write some of the exams too. When I took it, uh, you know, you would uh, you would have to buy the exam, you know, from Jeff. Right. But he would guarantee you um, within three points of his exam versus the state exam. Okay. And, um, you know, I was making, you know, about mid 80s on the test. Right. And I went there and took it. I made 86 on it. That's good. And I was, you know, same, pretty much in basically the same test on it. There you go. That's, yeah. that's good. Now, what happened to him? I wonder what. He, he had a lot of health problems. Um, I'm not sure, but I know when I went and seen him, he had some health problems. And uh, mm -hmm. he actually, he knew he was going downhill, so he, he hired a guy. I'm not, sure, I'm not been to that guy yet. That guy that he hired is supposed to be, you know, very good. He took over his business, but I don't, hmm. I don't know his name. But it's still JCR Productions. Uh, okay. I've heard he's good. Yeah, he was good. Well, but, them guys that know the code book live and breathe it. I mean, they, they do. It's amazing. Well, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Jerry's a walking code book. He can tell you. That's that's, that's why you, you need to take that class from him. When you get done everything here, I'd still go take it from him. It ain't but a Saturday, Sunday. And it's going, it's going to, it's going to reinforce everything you're getting here, and you'll be getting it straight more from somebody that really come right off of that state board that used to be in the board writing exams, mm -hmm. like the Jeff guy he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, they know, they know what questions are on the exam. They've been in there. They actually helped write them. Be around three hundred bucks to take take a weekend class, yeah, three fifty. Three to five hundred dollars. Yep. Yep. I don't know. If you can afford it, I don't know what to take to take one now. You can, you know, know how to study two or yeah. three months and maybe take it again for a good Right, yeah. It'll be worth it. Right. But I would, yeah. when you get ready to fill your life with those, I wouldn't drag out a whole year, you know, I'm three or four months, study every day. You better take it. Yeah, you better be fresh on it. Yeah. Because I'm telling you, man. That's not right. You got Cram, you, know, you will, <laughs> but way more, way more intense. I'm telling you, it's way more of a challenge. It is. It's it's a it's a major challenge. I could even think how to drive home later. I took it on both. <laughs> 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 but if you prepare over a long period of time. And then go ahead and do it pretty soon after you get all that prepared. And then if you feel pretty good about it, then go ahead and schedule it. Go ahead and do it. Don't wait three or four months. You know, maybe within, I'd say within a month, you should be fine. Yeah. Okay. We're signing off here.